Okay, <clears throat> so uh, I want to start thanking the organizers for uh, the invitation. It's such a wonderful place and it's a wonderful event. Um, so, I will be speaking about um, quantization and integrability. So, I will uh, make a, first an introduction to contextualize what, um, what the aim of this talk is about. Before I forget, all this is uh, based on work in progress with Rui Fernandez. So, <clears throat> okay, the one central object here is um, the Lie theory, in which you see Poisson manifolds as infinitesimal versions of uh, symplectic groupoids. And, <clears throat> okay, uh, let's say related to this, uh, there are two branches that I that will appear in this talk. One of them is uh, quantization. Of this Poisson manifold. So this relation actually was a driving force for, for this study in the beginning. And eventually many of these objects became of such a subject of study on their own. Um, one of them, which is the other ingredient in this talk, is um, integrability. And by this, I mean the question whether, given a Poisson manifold, if there is some symplectic groupoid integrating it or not. Um, <clears throat> perhaps in the, in the 80s, these two things were pretty much related somehow through this, but eventually <coughs> the understanding is that they grew apart. Um, and the aim of this talk is actually to establish a concrete connection between these two things. Um, so I will be assuming more familiarity with this side, and I will try to focus more on, on the ingredients here. I, I won't assume that much familiarity on this side. <clears throat> so even in this blackboard, I will um, tell you quickly about, well, maybe I should, track of time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, well, so what are some ideas here that I will be referring to? In general, the idea of quantization involves this idea of promoting functions to operators somehow, and this h bar is a scale parameter. <clears throat> And associated to this, at least in, in certain special cases, there is an operation that pops out coming from composition of operators, which is called star products. And the idea is that is the, let's say, intrinsic operation between the functions that uh, remembers composition of operators. So this is... <coughs> These uh, operations are star products, and they have some characterizing properties. Um, one of them is that um, uh, if you think of them as a function of this scale parameter h, the first term here is the usual product of functions, and then there are higher order terms. So you can think of this as giving a deformation of the product. This is the origin of the word uh, deformation, quantization. Then the other thing is the <coughs> correspondence principle. So if you scale like this, the commutator in this, co with respect to this operation, uh, 
the first term, the leading term that you see should be the Poisson bracket, the given Poisson bracket, and then there are high order terms. And finally, I will call this one, two, and three. And finally, uh, there is some, depending on the context that I will <laughs> explain that later, there, there should be some sort of associativity in this operation, because composition was associative. So, associative. Actually, the way one axiomatizes asso associativity will be a, a key point in this talk. So that's why I'm talking about it a bit loosely. <clears throat> so, okay, this talk. Uh, what we are going to see is, um, first of all, um, that to establish a complete connection between these two things, uh, we will have to uh, deal with non-formal deformations. So th this parameter, which very often is taken to be a formal parameter, now we will have to deal with it non-formal. Uh, <clears throat> so about this, I should say that uh, this also comes from earlier times, um, there, there are many exam paradigmatic examples in which you have non such non-formal quantizations, especially given by integral formulas. So that's, that will be our focus here, uh, from the work of many people, Alan Weinstein, and also you can see in the book of Karasev and Maslow, this is very extensively studied. And the other thing, the other ingredient that appears in, in this, let's say, answer is uh, failure of associativity, of higher associativities. For example, you can have four functions. And you can associate this in this way. And uh, because of this non-formal nature, this uh, star product does not define an algebra. It's what it's called a partial algebra. And it could happen that this is different. Even though the three associativity works, the four associativity might fail. Why is that? Let me write this. I see some confused faces, so. <laughs> Um, so why is it possible that these are, are not equal? Because typically what you do is you, you use the three associativity to go from this to this side. But because this is a partial algebra, only uh, some multiplications are not defined. And it could be that the, the third thing that you would write in the middle to get the identity is not really defined. So this is, uh, this is the reason why uh, this, um, these things could happen. Even though the left side is defined, the right side is defined, they are not equal. <clears throat> so this will be, um, the, at the end of the talk, let's say, this will be the, the reflection of not being integrable on the quantization. Um, so, when this is equal, whenever these two things are defined, this is called for associativity. So this would be the failure of for associativity. But then there would be five associativity and so on, depending on the number of elements here. Ale, uh, yes. this uh, star product then is not going to be defined for any pair. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This, this star product will be defined only on certain elements. And this comes from this uh, non-formal nature. So there will be analytical subtleties in the definition in trying to define the star product of any two functions. Okay. 
So I will begin with the, the sort of more familiar part, uh, talking about integrability. and uh, local group points. I will mostly do a drawing here. If we think of a group point of something like this, so this is a, a group point. This thing is the identities of the group point. The normal space here is by Power is the algebra. And if you choose a neighborhood of the identities, of some neighborhood like this, so you don't go far, you just stay close to the identities, this neighborhood inherits a structure on its own that is called a local group of structure. We'll call it G log, and it has uh, uh, the same algebra as the drawing suggests. So we, we say that both G and G log integrate this algebra. Now, <clears throat> as we all probably know, that uh, not every algebra is integrable by a G, but you can always find a local groupoid, irrespective of, of the existence of the bigger one. There are even explicit constructions. So, um, okay, what happens here? Let me say in words to speed up a bit. <laughs> um, when you have a global groupoid uh, and is source connected, this neighborhood generates all the bigger groupoid because if you have a big arrow, you can always obtain it by composition of small arrows that are close to the identity. Now, uh, suppose that we, we don't know the existence of this, but we do have a local group, which is always the case. You can try to uh, obtain this one by thinking of an abstract group made of words. This is a, a discrete version of this Weinstein group of construction, which you consider bad. Um, <clears throat> so, given this local group point, I can define another one. That would be like words. Words meaning of concatenation of arrows on G log. Modulo some identifications because if I can multiply these two and the result is still small, this should give me the same big arrow. <clears throat> okay, and just as in this Weinstein group point, this is always uh, an algebraic group point. You can do it with a topology, but it might fail to be smooth. And in this, uh, there is a paper by Rui Fernandez and Dan Michelis, that I think was published in 20, that says the following that A is integrable if and only if. Okay, I will skip a step here, but what I, I mentioned these words because uh, when you see what can fail to inherit a smooth structure, these kind of associators appear. So failures of higher associative. <coughs> you can see this, that uh, if you associate this in a certain way that is defined, and you associate it another way that is also defined, they should give the same result. If this fails, then uh, this kind of fails. Okay, so this is the idea that there existed a local group point, which is any associative for all n. So this is, uh, of course, there are many things to explain about this that I want. Uh, I will now turn more to the other side, but this is what we will 
This is how we will make the connection to integrability, is through these uh, associativities. Yes? Uh, there is a question in chat. Uh, is this WJ log 2 exactly the same as the uh, Wentz and Yeah. Well, I can say if it is integrable, yeah, this gives you the connected source, simply connected. Mm -hmm. And uh, surface. No? Smaller. Uh, depends on uh, what the local. The yeah, yeah, sorry. When this is uh, small enough, yes, it is. Yeah, if, if there is a hole, for example, here, in, when you choose, then it could be different. But you can always. Another thing that I should mention is that you can restrict this to smaller. And. Um, but you, you yeah. can start with G lock being void, which is not the sort of simply connected one. And then you obtain the same thing. Right, yes. Yeah, exactly. Good point. I, I'm thinking about germs mostly. And uh, I'm always allowing myself to, to restrict, and in particular to make the, the source fibers contractible. <coughs> uh, when you say words, do you have to like, parenthesize? When you say words. Ah, words. Oh, words. Words means uh, the set of composed, you know, the do union of all composed. You don't have to like put parentheses to say what you multiply with what first. Sorry, I don't understand. <laughs> what you... I mean, so in the blackboard up there, you, so you highlighted the problem that the order in which you multiply matters. Oh, right. Uh, no, here it's really words without the way, of, and then the equivalence relation takes into account the uh, assumption. This, this is uh, from the simplification. The point is a fundamental group. Yeah, probably. That's what I would say, that just as the Weinstein groupoid with paths and homotopies is a fundamental groupoid in a certain way, this is a simplicial version of that. And this should be related to the Chen-Chan version, right? The mm -hmm. stacking version, no? no? It's like, as Matthias is saying, you take the nerve of the local groupoid yeah, yeah, and yeah, but form but the yeah, simplicial... Yeah. But the stacking version is also... The simplicial homotopy yeah. groupoid is that yeah. nerve. And the uh, stacky version by Chen Chang is well, this is a little bit different because yes. there, there you don't start with a local group or there no, but with an algebra. Right. No, sure, 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 but 32. And so it, it has 32. 32. Yeah, good. <laughs> but it should be related. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. And there, and there's some assumptions on the local group or it can be related. Yeah. And there's some assumptions. Yeah. So now I will. Move to <clears throat> the, the quantum quantization part side. And here I, I want to mention, because probably most people are more familiar with the formal deformation case, but there are two types, let's say, at least for this talk, the, the formal uh, star products and the non formal. <clears throat> Within, so here there is uh, one definition, but here there is a variety of, of options that people have considered depending on, on the context and what you want to do. Let me mention some. Uh, one is uh, the case in which these formal series are actually convergent. This is one uh, case in which you have a non-formal star product. Uh, but this is rare because these, um, <clears throat> these are they behave as asymptotic expansions of smooth functions in general, so they are rarely analytic. There, are, there is another one jumping to a more strict version developed by Riefel based on C-star algebras and fields of C-star algebras. And that case, uh, well, has several examples, uh, but it's, uh, the, the axioms are very demanding. So... Uh, and there is a third one based on um, oscillatory integrals, which is, in a sense, more flexible than the C star case. And this is the one that we are going to consider here. So, so what are the names for the oscillatory integrals? Fourier integral operators. Uh, yeah. Is that what you are saying? No. no. Uh, which, which papers do you have? Ah, yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, so the... Quantization by oscillatory integrals was considered from the very beginning, so in particular examples. And um, I think a very good reference for this is Karasev and Maskov's book. 
but you can see this in, in most papers in the 80s, that they had this in the back of their mind, okay. through examples uh, of Alan Weinstein. <coughs> um, but, but, but maybe one should say that there is no formal definition. In yeah, yeah, the, the, that's also a good point that in many places the treatment is by examples, but there is no axiomatization in general. I should also mention there is a recent paper by Alberto and um, Benoit de Rand and Alan Weinstein where they also consider this kind of quantizations. Uh, okay, let me speed up here. Uh, I, I want to say a couple of words about the formal one and why essentially that does not address this. So the formal case, the idea is that one considers functions, uh, so formal um, power series in this formal parameter H, and the operation is given in this way. So it's a formal series. form and you, re you require that this is an associative product. Okay, so th this defines an algebra actually. And this uh, imposes lots of non-trivial quadratic conditions between these Bs. Another thing that I want to mention is that this typically one is interested in the case where the Bs are bidifferential of order uh, less or equal than n and n on each uh, entry. And this is sometimes called natural. <clears throat> okay, so in this uh, setting, which one should think of as being asymptotic expansions of non-formal cases, uh, von Savage proved that you can always find a quantization Um, for all Poisson manifolds, there's always exist a formal star product. Actually, the work shows much more. It shows uh, classification using uh, a deep theorem of formality. But I, I'm mentioning this because uh, when you see this, uh, you see that the existence is not... Uh, let's say the existence and the associativity and everything is, doesn't see the fact that whether this is integrable or not. So I think this is one natural way in which, at least in my mind, I always kind of split this in two with no connection, just because you have this very general existence. Um, okay, but, and one remark. So what is going on in terms of of this diagram. What is going on is that behind this, uh, any of these formal star products, so behind the formal star product, what, what it is, is not a, a groupoid, not a local groupoid, but a formal groupoid. A formal groupoid. I, I won't say that much about this, but well, one reference for this is the work of Karabegov, several papers where he explains. And this formal can be thought of as a limit in which this neighborhood becomes smaller and smaller. And then all the structure maps are formal power series in the normal direction. And uh, you see the... <coughs> Because everything is uh, these formal expansions, then there is no way of looking at uh, this failure of associativity. It's automatic. So that's why, essentially, we don't see this in the formal case. 
So now, um, okay, I think I, I'm going in a bit slow. I only have six or seven, this is three. <laughs> so uh, now I want to show you a couple of... Um, As I said, from, from earlier times, uh, there were several particular cases that were known in which you can build essentially this program with uh, not just looking at the asymptotic expansions, but with something that has more information, which are these oscillator integral formulas, or for example, in canonical quantization, let me just say it in words, uh, in canonical quantization, it's the case where you have a canonical symplectic space. And this here is an instance of what is known as symbol calculus for pseudo-differential operators. So this is a pseudo-differential operator. It could be the usual differential operators or more generally defined by integral kernels. And F happens to be its symbol. So th there, are, there is a way of taking a symbol and defining the operator, or taking the operator and defining the symbol. There are different kinds of symbols. They depend on choices, but they are all equivalent. <clears throat> so this is one instance in which you see that, ah, I'm sorry. And then when you do this, you find a star product. And if you take the asymptotic expansion, you find a formal in this sense, so this kind of formal power series with very specific uh, BNs, which, and this is Moyal product for certain choice of vital quantization map. So <clears throat> this is one particular case in which you see these two steps, let's say. There is a non-formal analytical construction, and then you go to the more purely algebraic uh, construction by taking asymptotic expansions. Now, that case uh, does not illustrate so much this point, it's very particular. So I'm going to speak about, very briefly, of some other paradigmatic case, which is the dual of a Lie algebra with the linear Poisson structure. <laughs> oh, sorry, I want to call this H, <coughs> not to confuse with um, G, the groupoid. So here, and here is where you see Lie theory coming into place, even if it wasn't in the formulation. One way of producing a quantization of this is as follows. You take a, a Lie group integrating this Lie algebra, H. Here you have the, the Lie algebra as a tangent space as the unit. And then, Another ingredient is uh, to choose an open in which the exponential is a diffeomorphism. So let's call this open U, is in the Lie algebra. And what happens is that um, because this is diffeomorphic to this piece of the group, uh, of the group, this inherits a local group structure, locally group structure. And what we do to define the, <clears throat> the quantization is to use the convolution with respect to this local group structure. So um, let me write a concrete formula. So I want to define one of these star product operations. And what I do. Sorry, you mean uh, convolution or distribution? Yeah, I will tell you about this in a second. So I will use Fourier transform that I will tell you now, recall what it is. Here is the convolution with respect to this local group. And then I Fourier transform back. So the idea is that Fourier transform changes an original variable for the dual variable. 
So the original variable lives in H star, and the dual lives in H. That's why uh, I can do this operation. So this is naturally a function or a distribution on U. When uh, F1 has the appropriate support for, let's say, behavior. I, I will come back to this in a second, but I, I just want to mention that uh, by construction, this is, I, I think, what uh, prompted perhaps the whole idea of, of using groupoids to find quantization, because eventually the, the very hard part, which is to deal with associativity, can be traced back to this Lee theoretic fact that the group or the local group is associated. So this is a very paradigmatic example of why Lee theory comes into play. Uh, but another thing, uh, let me mention that this is called uh, this Fourier transform with H as a scale parameter. Let me just write N is the dimension of the manifold. And uh, I integrate over X. This is the usual Fourier transform, but H appears here as a scale, it's a unit of frequency parameter. Like this, so this is evaluated at p. Okay, so this is sometimes called also semi-classical Fourier transform. So, so this is refill. Well, I think that the refill. Yes. Yeah. This uh, construction can be found in the paper by Riffel. Uh, okay, but the maybe next point is that this is already well defined and so on, but one key point is that one can give an integral formula for this expression. And the result is not just any integral, it's a very specific type of integral that is called oscillatory. It has, for example, stationary phase approximation and other things, uh, other properties. So um, let me just show you very quickly how, the same happens, by the way, with, the, with this, it's also an oscillatory type of integral. Mm -hmm. Good point. Uh, <clears throat> it's uh, isomorphic to that, but in the this is related to Anton's question. There are two ways of doing this. If you think of Fourier transform as a distribution, and you just do convolution of distributions, this is one option. The other option is to restrict a bit more the regularity, and instead of and using picking a hard measure and doing the convolution of the functions. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, so the difference is one uses hard measure and the other doesn't. The one that doesn't is the what you just said, the universal velocity after this formal asymptotic expansion, and the other one. There are different, there are several papers describing different possibilities which are all equivalent. One coincides with Konsevich, star product, that has a special property of the center uh, being invariant polynomials that doesn't have the, the usual quantization map, uh, and so on. And th there is another option which is the refill one in which you directly use the hard mesh. Okay, I hope I answer the question. <clears throat> but they are all equivalent. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to write a, an integral formula. So you use these integration variables. Some of them come from performing this, and, and other integrations come from the convolution itself. Um, yeah. There is another integral here, two parameters, E and P tilde. These vary in H star, but P and P tilde vary in uh, So this is at X, let's say. Um, 
So this is P contracted with X minus P tilde contracted with X1 minus so the inverse product with X2. And here there is the, the measure. There is a measure induced by the high measure. <clears throat> So this product that appears here is the product on the local group. If you wanted, you could replace this by the BCH formula. So this is a very concrete expression, and it's of oscillatory type, which is... Uh, sorry, minus one is also on the sound group law? Or, or yeah, yeah, this is sorry, the inverse with respect to this. But uh, the BCH has this nice property that it's just minus. <laughs> Yeah. So p tilde minus one is minus p tilde. Yes. <laughs> I, I'm uh, okay. I'm writing it like this because you could, in principle, use another diffeomorphism. It will still work. <laughs> it's just that the, the, the product gets deformed. Um, okay. Great. So no idea. Okay, maybe it's and just and 10 minutes. <coughs> and and, and 5pp tilde is the, the flow function, or what is it? This one is just yeah. the flow function. This is a measure. I don't want to write the formula, but it, it comes from the hard measure that you chose. Okay. Yes? It, it just has the, again, these kind of expressions inside the hard measure. Of factors like this. Mm. Okay, uh, another thing that I want to mention is that, yeah. So, but do, do you have to assume that H is compact, or does this work? No, 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 no. Uh, you see, the only part you see of H is the yeah, you know, fit. So, you don't even, it, it's irrespective which integration you choose, actually. Yeah, right. So you don't it's, need to have that, like, like yes. how many body, in the as I said, you could express everything intrinsically in terms of the BCH directly yeah, with the yeah. algebra. Uh, yeah, and another thing that I want to mention here is that this is, you can see that uh, this kind of operation uh, is not uh, an algebra for all functions because you need, uh, let's say, for this to be well defined or have the right properties, you need this Fourier transform to have support in the right place. And not only that, when you do the convolution that is a bit like multiplying this to set, you also want that the, the result does not fall out of your view. And that's why essentially it's a partial algebra. So this kind of integral formula Although it has the advantage of being uh, non-formal, so it has more information, the algebraic structure that it defines is more complicated than the asymptotic expansion, which is a true algebra. So maybe you should multiply those by some cutoff function? Yeah, yeah, okay. this is a good point. If you're worried about the definition, so this being defined for any, you can always put here a cutoff function. And then it's defined for any function, but the right properties only hold for functions that have the right. So it's a trade-off if you want uh, not to care about the domain of definition, but then you lose the properties, for example, of being a true deformation outside of this, because you just cut it off to zero. <laughs> Thank you, Louis. Uh, Okay, so we are approaching the end. <laughs> what I'm the, the plan next is to tell you a bit what are the ingredients that one uses to formalize this kind of oscillatory integrals for arbitrary manifolds, not just for this linear case. I, I should also mention that when the manifold is symplectic, so this pi is symplectic, the use of these techniques that I'm going to mention now, of semi-classical analysis and Fourier integral predicates, is the standard one. 
So when, when you have a symplectic manifold, typically people consider uh, integration by quantization by integral grade. Um, okay, so this is five, right? Elements of semi classical analysis. Uh, so again, these are elements in a sub-branch, let's say, of analysis, very well established, <coughs> textbooks about these things. It started with, a, well, some uh, of these objects started with the work of Hormander about uh, for PDEs and, and the use of micro-local calculus and so on. Uh, I, we particularly used a more recent book of William Stenberg that is called Semi-Classical Analysis, and other, also other books that are more, less advanced by Swarovski and Martinez. <clears throat> um, okay, let's say this semi-classical word here, it, it makes reference to the fact that all the objects that one considers, they are age families. And there is a prescribed behavior, or a list of prescribed behaviors as edge goes to zero. In, in some other context, so some, this was, many of them, lots of the motivation come from studying uh, the Schrodinger equation, which by the way, is also linked to quantum mechanics. So it's not a surprise that this appears uh, here. But in, there are some other PDEs in which the scale parameter is not h bar, it's some frequency parameter, for example, and so on. Uh, so they are standard techniques. Another key concept that I will just mention quickly is the concept of micro-locality, micro, -locality, micro -local. So <clears throat> the idea is that uh, just as, suppose that we are on a manifold x, When you have a function and you refer to local properties, then you express them in terms of subsets of X, for example, the support, or things like this. And now in micro local, one makes reference to um, subsets of T star X. And uh, I, I don't have time to explain this in detail, but morally the, the idea is that the X directions refer to properties of the function F, whereas the cotangent directions refer to properties of the Fourier transform of F. So for example, one says that F is micro-localized into some subset of the cotangent bundle when the support of F lies inside here and the support of the Fourier transform lies inside here. But the idea is that put two, these two things together into the cotangent bundle. <clears throat> this uh, idea, I think, goes back to Hormander in the study of singularities of solutions of uh, PDEs. Um, another, okay, now approaching more the, our task, the idea is, um, okay, is there any object, well-established object behind this kind of integral expressions if you want to see them as operations acting on functions? And the answer is yes. The answer is called uh, Fourier integral operator. But for that, I, I need to mention before these oscillatory functions. So oscillatory functions are functions that appear here in the kernel, for example. That, that has this kind of exponent and a, a uh, factor here. So one typical example of oscillatory function is something like this, a smooth function of x, and then e to the i over x, h phi of x. Um, OK, so this is one example. But in the theory, one sees that one needs to consider more general ones uh, in particular, 
the idea, I just write this. You can have an oscillatory function here on, on the space, a vibration that has more variables, and you push it forward. So you integrate out the extra variables, and you also declare the result to be an oscillatory function. And on, not only this, that you can have this presentation of, the, of your function locally across x, and still you call it an oscillatory function. And this is called generating function, and the ones that appear here are called generalized generating functions, or sometimes more fam more families. Uh, and, okay, just moving ahead. Uh, these these uh, functions have a... I want to mention stationary phase approximation. So if one considers, uh, for example, in this uh, integral, suppose that we are in Rn, just to not complicate things. Um, the stationary phase approximation tells you what is the leading term to this integral as h goes to zero. But uh, before this, I want to mention that there are, let's say, I open this into two cases. One is a case in which phi has no critical points. And what you obtain is a function of h that vanishes to infinite order. So this is one key estimate in this theory. And the other case is suppose that phi has a, a non-degenerate, only one non-degenerate isolated critical point. x0, and then the, the asymptotic expansion works like this, n over 2, I think, n is again the, the dimension. Yeah. So there is a factor that has to do with, um, let's say, the, the second order derivatives of phi. Then there is the value at that point, and then there are higher order terms. So you see the, the, the asymptotic expansion is, the leading term is controlled by this critical point. Um, well, so, but in general, what happens is the following. Let me write it like this. That um, these kind of oscillatory functions they have associated to, it, to them, let's say by definition, a Lagrangian set manifold of T star X that could be called uh, the wave front or wave front of oscillations. Or there are several names. Let's say wave front for this top of this. And the idea is that this Lagrangian set manifold controls. It's a, it's a geometric object from which you can extract two, <laughs> the, these leading behaviors. OK. So this minutes. I'm going to try to erase it. Okay, I, I will do a summary of, of the rest. Okay, so one last thing. Uh, a Fourier integral operator, Fourier integral operator, it's an integral operator, so it's something like this. Whose kernel, whose integral kernel, uh, so it's something like this, let's say, applied to f1 as a function of x2 is given by an integral kernel. And the definition is that the integral kernel has to be one of these oscillatory functions. So in particular, it will have one of these wavefronts uh, inside Q. 
here, it's a Lagrangian here. Given that I'm running out of time, I'm going to now try to put everything together and, and answer this. Uh, yeah. Do this. Be great. So, okay. We were trying to establish this relation, and in particular, more specifically, what happens to quantization when the Poisson manifold is not integral? We saw that in the formal case, essentially nothing new happened. Uh, so this takes us to these non-formal star products, but it's not a, that we use it arbitrarily. Actually, these things existed uh, for a long time, and they are the paradigmatic examples of quantization. They are all of this type, of this Fourier. Now we can see. So what I mean is that, just as in this example that is now here, um, this operation is some Fourier integral operator applied to these two functions. So this is our class. And then what happens, so what happens when it's not integral, right? So for this, I, I just want to mention one thing. I, I was planning to mention more things, but I just say it in words. If you have such a thing satisfying uh, generalization or an adaptation of these axioms, and you take the formal ta Taylor expansion, you get a formal star product. So you can show this. So this is like an enhancement of, of the underlying formal one. Another thing is that this guy has, uh, by definition, uh, associated this way from Lagrangian that lives where it lives here. And you can show, again, from the axioms that this has to be a local groupoid multiplication. Local symplectic groupoid, let's say. It defines a local symplectic groupoid structure in a neighborhood of the zero section inside here with respect to the canonical symplectic form. So that's how uh, out of this we automatically gain a, a local well, something that was hit. I know it's no, it's not all here. So uh, there is an underlying local groupoid, but it, in the formal case, this was formal groupoid. Now it's a local groupoid, and it, as we know, it carries the information in a, in these associators of whether it's integrable or not. So th the last uh, thing is what is the main result then? I'm sorry that I was planning to actually write down the, the axioms corresponding, but I ran a bit out of time, but... Um, okay, what is the main result? That, suppose that you have a Poisson manifold that admits uh, one of these non-formal quantizations. Uh, let's say, quantization so the the operation is essentially given by FH don't worry I just state this and I finish <laughs> um, so as we saw at least in, in this example there is a partial algebra associated with this and suppose that the associated partial algebra is N associative for all N greater or equal to 3. Because the operation of multiplication is partially defined, this is not automatic, so this is a requirement. Then what happens is that the Poisson structure, the Poisson manifold is integral. So this is, let's say, the main result. So integrability appears as a necessary condition 
to have such, let's say, good non-formal quantizations. So, thank you. Okay. I, I, I got two questions. One, maybe like uh, I don't know on on this this FH. You're saying that if you expand the H, you get the uh, formal mm -hmm. quantization. Do you mean that this FH contains all the information about whatever Kantevich or some other? Formula or, or what, what is this FH? Is, is it, does it have all this formality map inside? Yes. Or, or, or what? Uh, the, 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 the key point there is existent. If it exists, it oh, has okay. the information of, of the formal. Uh, okay, okay. Yes. So, uh, but uh, just to complete mm -hmm. my personal conjecture or whatever thought is that you can always find, for any Poisson manifold, you can always find one of these. It's just that, as we know now, it might not fail to be higher associative. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I do expect that there is an enrichment of Konsevich's theorem from formal to this kind of operators. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And the, the other question, so in, in, in this main result, mm -hmm. uh, you're saying that if this n associativity holds for all n, mm -hmm. uh, just I'm, I'm a little bit wondering, but uh, there are cases where it is satisfied because you explained to us, right? Oh, yeah. That if you have, uh, if you are, say, domain U or something, right? Is sort of uh, compact, mm -hmm. right? Then it's unlikely it's going to work because, right, you you have two supports and then... At yeah, some, this drawing. Yeah, at some point the support of the convolution will go out, right? Yeah, yeah but... So, so that doesn't mean that for this to hold, you basically needed to be completely... No, no, no. Yeah. The, the point is the following, that mm -hmm. remember that any associativity is for some of these two things to be equal whenever these two things are defined. Mm -hmm. So if, if something like this happens that you go outside, mm -hmm. then it's not defined and it's not part of your requirement. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, uh, for example, in this case it happens, certainly. When, whenever, you know, here... Why, if why it has what if the algebra is not important? If the algebra is important, then you actually have a complete uh, yeah, yeah, you could. But I, I'm just saying that uh, the reason why it works is that you only consider the case in which this goes here, oh, okay. and because this was a, a well defined, okay, okay. so this yes. is an example, yes, this is an example, yeah, yeah all, all even uh, canonical quantization is an example, mm -hmm. and the symplectic ones are an example as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's just a big question. I mean, uh, the wavefront is kind of just the zeroth order approximation of the uh, oscillatory function. Uh, I mean, they, they, they work with a principal symbol, uh, which is this half density with values in the Maslow bundle. Mm -hmm. Does the Maslow index somehow show up in your? Yeah. yeah. Let me try to answer this. The right, OK. I, there is a, a way of taking an oscillatory function and actually having more data, not just the Lagrangian, but a half density on top of the Lagrangian. And I think, uh, for example, when, when you compute the L2 pair, you see these things. The leading order information in this, it comes from the intersection of Lagrangians. And the, the factors that appear are expressed in terms of the, this geometric information of the half densities. I don't know if this. Uh, ah, sorry, no. Can I say? Yeah. Yeah, I've, the, 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 the principal symbol is this half density on, on the wavefront set. Yes. Is values in the Maslow bundle. Yes. And, and, and this, this plays a role, like, like when you do, do this, um, when you have cos Yes. Uh, you have these phase shifts appearing in the, in the, in the wavefront set. So, so yes. So like these phase shifts and, and these things play a role. Uh, oh, now I understood your question. Uh, my answer is no, but just because um, in the in the end, I said that this is a local symplectic rucoid, and this. Okay, there are some details that I didn't say much, but because we are interested in microlocal behavior near zero 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 here. This thing that you're saying, I think, does not play a role. Mm -hmm. 
But I, I don't know, because in proving that you have a symplectic groupoid, at some point you have to take the principal symbol mm -hmm. of an operator. Yes. And there, I think it plays a role. So, uh, we invariantly define it if you do it on a manifold, if M is a manifold. Yeah, but I, well, when I had a look at this, my feeling is that the, this mass love index will be constant and you can essentially forget about it. It won't change in the germ that you're interested in. But for example, if you, have, if you want to enlarge this to make, let's say, a global group point or something, that, then this might play a role. Okay, so we'll have to probably move the discussion to the coffee break. So, so let's thank Alex. Thank you.